Welcome to the Bible Feed podcast. Great to have you with us, back with us again. And if you haven't logged into or, or tuned into a, a Bible Feed podcast before, welcome as well. It's great to have you with us. My name's Dan Weatherall and I'm with Paul Davenport and we're going to be continuing something that's loosely connected to the devil. We've done the devil and Satan. I say we've done it. We've ticked it off and done nothing more can be said about it in, uh, in highly inverted commas. <laughs> There's a lot more that could be said, but we, we've looked at the devil. We've looked at the Satan. We've looked at demons and there's been something that we've been dancing around, as it were, because there's a topic that is related. And that's to do with the idea of angels and the phrase sons of God and whether or not angels can fall or rebel. And there's a whole theme there, isn't there, Paul? Yeah, and we want to build on what we've covered so far in thinking about the devil and Satan and demons. And if you've listened to those episodes, then it'll sort of already be obvious where we're heading with the idea of fallen angels and uh, and sons of God. I think right at the outset, as we tackle this aspect of the subject, we'd better acknowledge that we're not going to cover every aspect. We're not going to address every question. We are going to skim across some fairly thorny passages and think about some ways of interpreting them. But I guess we're on a continuous journey of learning and expanding our knowledge and, and interpretations. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Very true. I think I think it's helpful, though, to do this kind of high-level view. And sometimes you can get really stuck in the weeds, you can get really lost in the detail, and you can miss the forest for the trees. Mm. And so it is good to just step back and think, okay, what have we learned from the picture so far? And there are many different things or interpretations, things being said about the sons of God, what that phrase means whether angels can rebel, whether there's a whole load of rebellions that have happened in Scripture that are sort of hinted at. We've got, to, we've got to set that within the overall context. So that's what we need to do. So let's just very quickly think about where we've got to. So the devil and Satan, we looked at those terms and they've kind of got just normal meanings, haven't they? You know, false accuser or the adversary, the opponent. And, and yet the yeah. way they're used, we've seen them used to describe that desire in humans to tempt and to lead to wrongdoing or, or sin. So we get that principle, that desire, that sinfulness personified in certain parts of the literature of the Bible and therefore called the false accuser or called the opponent. Yeah. And that's showing how damaging it is. So, you know, we've seen people who are tempted by their own desires, people who have been afflicted by disease, and that's that's rooted right back into the the fact that we're mortal and that stems from sin. And then we've seen the devil and Satan also used in this wider political or religious organisational structure that, that becomes a group of humans who act on impulse and selfishness and wickedness when they're grouped together into a whole system. That is the devil. That is Satan. You know, that's in a nutshell what we what we got to <laughs> with the devil and Satan. Yeah, and then we took a whole episode to think about demons as a related subject. And we saw that from a scriptural point of view, demons as actual personal beings are, are not really something that the Bible talks about as, as having any real existence, not something therefore that we should be concerned about or, or afraid of. You know, the consistent theme of the Bible is God is one. There is only one God like him. There is only one with power. And in a sense, that's all we need to know and, and, and be concerned about. There are references outside the Gospels to demons, but that's always talking about uh, idols and the idols that the nations around Israel worshipped. And they're described very much in terms of these are not gods. These have no existence other than a sort of virtual existence that we talked about that because people think they exist and they have power over people and influence their behavior. And the Bible talks about them in that sense, in a way to argue against them and their influence. We then look to the Gospels and references to demons in the context of healing emerge in the Gospels as a product of the first century culture derived from Persian influence in between the Old Testament and the New Testament, that these spirits caused illnesses that, that couldn't be explained. Today, we would understand those as psychological or mental illnesses. And, and given the broader scriptural context that these things don't exist, don't have power, we can read the Gospels and understand them in that way as those kind of illnesses that Jesus was was healing. And I think we ended up by saying that even if you struggle to accept that these spirits, demons don't exist, the really important point, the most important point is that you have no need to think of them as part of your 
theology as part of your worship, as part of your service mm. before God. You have no need to fear them, no need to fight them. They're irrelevant to how we serve God. God is one, and that's the end of it, really. Mm. So there we are with what we think the devil and Satan is and what demons are as well. But what we need to do now is unravel some other concepts. There's been a, a different point of view that's been really gaining a lot of traction or popularity recently, largely through the work of a few biblical scholars, but one biblical scholar, the late Michael Heiser, who's written a few books, hasn't he? The Unseen Realm is the big one, I think, all to do with demons and angels and a background there. So Mike Heiser has done a lot of work in revealing the historical context to the Old Testament particularly. And that's been really helpful. And he you know, sits alongside mm. people who've done similar work like John Walton. And there's some really, really helpful work in this comparative studies. But I, what I think this, this view... Well, it's turned into more than just a set of comparative studies to help us illuminate the Old Testament, but turned into a sort of salvation plan. You know, now we mm. need to understand the scripture in this way. And it's distinctly dualistic. It's distinctly conflict theology, this kind of war between yeah. God, who is good, and then the forces of, of evil. And that it's a, an ancient Near East rooted idea, but it's presenting something which we've already said we don't think is there in the Bible. So do you want to lead us through this idea first, Paul, just a summary of it. Yeah, and I'd agree. The work of Michael Heiser, he was the scholar in residence at the Logos Bible Software, I think, for a while, and you know read yeah. lots of his commentary and, and information about lots yeah, of yeah. And, and really useful stuff. But as you say, formulated this this whole framework for a different way of reading the Bible and thinking about the salvation plan that's described there. So there's seven points. I'll just go through them, which are essentially a summary of the argument that he makes in the Unseen Realm. And, and it starts with Eden, with the Garden of Eden, and he concludes that the Garden of Eden was the site of a heavenly council. But one of that council fell. One of that, the members of that heavenly council fell. And that manifests itself in those opening chapters of Genesis in the serpent in the Garden of Eden. It then goes on to describe the events in Genesis 6 with the sons of God and the daughters of men, a interesting passage, which we'll come yep. to, <laughs> that other members of this council also fell. You know, angels, he concludes, mm. that sinned and fell. Then reaches a point by the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible, where there's a, a couple of verses there from which the conclusion is drawn that God essentially hands over all the other nations apart from Israel to be under the power of these other gods, angels, these other sons of God, whatever the terminology is. And Israel is for, is for Yahweh, but the other nations are under the hand of other gods. And that this collection of gods, if you like, is alluded to in other passages through the Old Testament. For example, in Job, the beginning of Job, and in Psalm 82. And then goes on to describe how the purpose of God is really about overthrowing these gods that are controlling the other nations. And that the plagues in Egypt, the conquest of Canaan, is part of this battle, this cosmic battle between Yahweh and these other gods mm -hmm. who have control over other nations. Then moves into the New Testament and Jesus casting out demons and performing exorcisms, a part of that struggle against fallen angels. And the whole thing ends up with the intention of God being to replace the heavenly council with humans, with glorified humans that become a new heavenly council, make war against the, these hostile former angel gods and their forces and uh, defeat them and then enjoy an exalted future with Christ. So that's the whole framework and salvation plan mm. that that is constructed around the ideas. So that's a really good summary. Hopefully we've sort of done it justice to try and summarise it briefly. I mean, first impressions from that, I've interacted a lot with his work. He was very prolific and you know, others have taken on that mantle as well. But first impressions from that summary and from that worldview is well firstly how it certainly cuts across a lot of the things that we've already seen in this series about the devil satan and things like that mm. but particularly about the fact that we've seen that there really is a, a monotheistic confidence about the bible isn't there and this doesn't feel like that at all and, and i know that, that i think the claim is well yahweh is still supreme over everything but it really doesn't feel very monotheistic we have other divine beings with independent power and whether or not we call them gods lowercase mm. g or, or whatever it really doesn't feel like we're sitting in a monotheistic worldview what do, you, what do you think paul that's certainly one thing that jumps out the other thing that jumps out for me and having read unseen realm i haven't read other books 
but the focus or the lack of focus that there is in that salvation scheme on human responsibility for their own behavior and okay. human responsibility mm. for their own failure and and recovery from that you know where is human rebellion and ignoring of god in that scheme where is human redemption and and forgiveness and almost the role of, of jesus in in this and the sacrifice of jesus and what that does as a means of bringing humans back to god and to be reconciled to god is is almost a sideshow in in this in this thing that's going on unseen behind the veil as it were yeah humans become just caught in the crossfire maybe don't they or you know they're just a a thing on the side or or a plan b or whatever so the other thing as well is how much this relies on reading between the lines as i think we'll see that we have to go to passages and then really have a look between the verses and you know you then have to as i think we'll see is creatively interpret and introduce other mm. things which just aren't simply aren't there in the text a lot of this comes from for example like the books of enoch which are basically doing the same thing aren't they they're taking the Genesis stories, and they're they're reinterpreting them with additional layers of detail. They're just reimagining what this might mean. So yeah, it does really seem to be relying on on creative writing, really. Just thinking back to the first episode in this series, I think we spent the first sort of 20 minutes thinking about mm. a couple of tests. I don't know if you can remember them. I think the first was that we've got to ask, does our interpretation support or contradict the monotheistic worldview of Scripture? There's a, there's a backbone to Scripture, which is mm. monotheistic. So when we, we stumbled across something in this topic, well, does it support that or does it contradict it? So that's one test we can apply. Yeah, and, and there was a second one, which is where we talked about comparative studies, the value of that, but also the limitations of that. While that might lead you to a conclusion, do we also take enough account of interpretations of these kind of subjects where there are specific references in the New Testament by Jesus and or the apostles? And you know, does our interpretation properly acknowledge the interpretations that Jesus and the apostles put on on things? Yeah, right. so we've got to make sure that both of those things are factored into our interpretations. Okay, so let's let's get into this then. Remembering those tests, and let's think about these these points that you've just run through. We'll start off with point one, and I think you know we'll maybe get through the first three, first four, and, and see where we go. Okay, so that first point then, Eden being the site of the heavenly council. So we're in Genesis chapters two and three, of course. Heavenly Council, yeah. the idea presumably there means that God, Yahweh, had angels ruling with him. So spiritual beings, angels, and that yeah. one of that council fell, rebelled, and that's where we are introduced to the serpent. So we'll start off in, in Genesis, and we'll actually start off in Genesis chapter 1, okay. um, where we get a hint of this council with Yahweh. But there's also a reliance on a couple of passages, one in Ezekiel's prophecy, chapter 28, and then one in Isaiah chapter 14, okay. which we'll think about as well. But if we start with Genesis chapter 1, we have, you know, on the sixth day, well-known words, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So, so there's just a little hint there in God saying, let us. So who's God talking to? Who's he addressing in making that statement? Mm. Let us make. When God does make the humans, it's just God. So God created mm. man in, in his own image. But as part of that process, God is addressing a group. So there's just a hint there that there's some group of beings there with him. Usual interpretation, both Jewish and Christian, is that's an angelic host. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily involved in the act of creation, but they're observing, wondering at it, no doubt. So there's a hint there, though, of that angelic host. I'm not sure I would go so far as to say it describes a council. No. in which there's a collaboration, there's there's points of view coming in and a collaborative decision taken. Don't really get that sense. I, I suppose the other observation is that the host being this congregation of angels, if you like. But they're not in Eden, they're the host of heaven. So if there's a council, which it doesn't really say, 
Mm. So so that that's what we get from Genesis 1. Yes, there's maybe a hint at an angelic host there. I'm not sure it is explicitly a council or even uh, or not not necessarily mm. in Eden. And yeah, in Genesis 1 and 2 as well, it's the humans that are, are told to have dominion as well, isn't it? To occupy that position of rulership, mm. which you know arguably yeah. is meant to be there as that divine council. So so yeah, you really do seem to have to read between the lines if you're just using Genesis. Yeah, so let's look at these other two references in the later prophet. So Ezekiel is relatively late, 6th century BC, and we're looking at Ezekiel chapter 28. Okay. And, and there's a passage there that we'll look at verse 13 and 14. So I'll just read those. It says, You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardius, topaz and diamond, beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire. You walked. Mm, there's um, the mountain. And, yeah, that is picked out. There's the mountain. There's the garden. There's yeah, the garden of God. You were in Eden. And it carries on. You were blameless. But then you became proud and I cast you to the ground in verse 17 because of the multitude of your iniquities and so that's picked up as okay this is one of the members of this council that that rebelled but when we just read the chapter the context of the chapter it's actually from verse 11 moreover the word of the lord came to me son of man raise a lamentation over the king of tyre and say to him thus says the lord god and, it, and this is words addressed to the king of tyre mm. so it's very poetic language Mm. And we might wonder, why is it using language about Eden, the garden of God, and, and the, the holy mountain, and so on? That is common language about a, a situation of prosperity, security. You know, Tyre was actually in the northwest of Israel, and where Lebanon is today, famous for cedars, trees, mm -hmm. and supplied, you know, the king of Tyre supplied Solomon with, with trees and materials for the building of the temple, and so on. So there was this this kind of glory period for Tyre in which there's great prosperity, fruitfulness associated with these great trees and, and supplies to, to King Solomon. That's picked up actually in, in Ezekiel 31, just a couple of chapters later, in which, so the chapter starts with, these are words to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, but verse 3, behold, Assyria was a cedar in Lebanon. So there's a description of Assyria now as a great cedar with beautiful branches. Its top is in the clouds, the waters nourished it. And then we get down to verse eight, the cedars in the garden of God could not rival it, mm. nor the fir trees equal its boughs. So this is common language, you know, references to the trees of, of the garden as, as a poetic language to describe, you know, great prosperity, security, but both the king of Tyre and Assyria are falling from that that position. So, nearly finished with Ezekiel twenty eight. Mm -hmm. It does also say in in Ezekiel twenty eight and verse nine about this king of Tyre. So, will you still say I am a god? So he's claiming to be a god in the presence of those who kill you, though you are but a man and no god. So it's clearly not a god that this is addressed to, but it's someone who is proud, elevating themselves to the position of a god. And there are archaeological discoveries of a sphinx with the you know, body of an animal, head of the, the king of Tyre, with inscriptions referring to it being in the mountain of his god. Okay. Uh, so you can read that, Ezekiel 28, and every part of the imagery that's used is absolutely applicable to the king of Tyre mm. and his former prosperity and then his pride oppression of slaves and so on which brings about his downfall mm. yeah so it's political commentary isn't it and it's using mm. lots of this imagery including imagery from eden eden language and, mm. and that sort of thing and i think something similar is probably going on in in isaiah chapter 14 as well isn't it so here there's that other quite famous passage isaiah 14 verse yeah. 12 how are you fallen from heaven o day star son of dawn how are you cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low? And uh, it's that day star, which is Lucifer, isn't it? Is it translated that mm. in the King James Version? I'm I think it's Lucifer in the King James Version, but that's a Latin word. So I think yeah. it's probably Lucifer in the Vulgate, Latin so, Vulgate. Yeah. 
that's where this passage has historically sort of drawn a connection to to an archetypal mm. fallen angel. How are you fallen from heaven? Day star, sun at dawn, cut down to the ground. But again, just going back to the context, which is verse four, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. How the oppressor has ceased, yeah. the insolent fury ceased. Again, it just seems to be, again, another oracle against a proud human ruler who is going to be brought down because they, they thought they were too arrogant, too, they, they thought they were too uh, above judgment, above condemnation, but they're yeah, going to be and, brought and down. Yeah, and placing themselves in the position of, of a god. Yeah. Well, that's verse 13, isn't it? You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven yeah. above the stars of God. I'll set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. But verse 16, those when, when, when he's brought down, those will ponder at you over you. Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms? So clearly we are talking about mm. the man, the king of Babylon, aren't we? Yeah. But again, in, in this very poetic language, and possibly language that does, you know, does reflect some ancient Near East ideas that did describe divine council ideas yeah and see the way proponents of the dualistic idea that we've we've outlined describe these passages both ezekiel 28 and isaiah 14 is that yes of course it's talking about the king of tyre and the king of babylon Mm. but it's coded language you need to you need to see through the veil of the text if you like to the coded language that's in there and that it's actually referring to something and that that sort of illustrates that you already need to hold the view Mm. you need to already have that worldview in your mind which is as we've said distinctly different from the monotheistic worldview that the bible presents you already need to have that in your mind and then you bring that to these passages and you can see yeah you can crack the code you can see through the coded language and that in itself is almost a bit of an admission that it's not really there explicit Mm. you have to know it's there Mm. already before you come to these passages yeah and part of the the beauty of the comparative studies has been to to see that yes there is some cultural references in all this for example a lot of the surrounding cultures had a view that there was a garden where where god dwelt or the the gods dwelt and very often that was on a mountain as well but what what's really helpful when we look at the comparative studies and the background is to then see the difference so so here, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, they seem to be repurposing this material. And mm. there's things that are very different. So you don't get capricious gods fighting with, with humans in the Bible narrative. Actually, this material is now repurposed to be political commentary against the proud human rulers and oppressors. So Yeah, and in both those examples, King of Tyre and King of Babylon, they were putting themselves in the position of a god over their over yeah. the people. Yeah. So it's it's perfect language to describe that then, isn't it? Yes. Okay, so that was the first point. So the second point then, well, there's another fall or another rebellion, and this time it's a whole load of them. And this is Genesis chapter 6, which is one of the most enigmatic and and bizarre (laughs) passages in the Bible, isn't it? So this is the passage that starts, when man began to multiply on the face of the land, daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose and and then it describes the the corruption of the earth. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. So that's that's Genesis six. The situation there. So the the point here, the claim here is that the sons of God is now referring to this divine council, this heavenly council of angels, and that's yeah. the term that's used. And that they come and have relations with humans, and that there's the production of offspring which sometimes is linked to the Nephilim in verse 4, and there's all sorts of yeah. interpretations that can spin out from that. So yeah, let's unpick that. Yeah, so we really need to get underneath what is this term, the sons of God, referring to. And I guess we'll cut 
straight to the chase, as it were, and go to the New Testament and go to Jesus' comment on angels, okay. which is in Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20, just a couple of verses there. Jesus is answering a question about the resurrection. And as part of his answer in Luke chapter 20, he says, verse 34, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. And then he goes on to prove the resurrection. So I think this verse tells us a couple of things. Um, It tells us pretty categorically that angels, one of the characteristics of angels in Jesus' mind is that they don't marry. Mm. And what we've just read in Genesis chapter 6 is they took wives. And so that immediately should suggest to us that perhaps we shouldn't jump to the conclusion that they're, they're angels. The other thing that this verse tells us is that there are two, at least, categories of beings that can be described as sons of God. You know, one is angels, and the other is those that are considered worthy to attain that age. Mm. So, you know, faithful human beings are also a group of people that can be called sons of God. And and that's where I think we have to go with with Genesis chapter 6 in order to make sense of it and not contradict what mm. Jesus says about angels, they don't, they don't marry. And actually, when we start to then go back into the Old Testament, we do find exactly that, that there's people, faithful human beings, that attach themselves to the name of the Lord, the name of Yahweh. You know, right back in Genesis chapter 4, from verse, verse 26, which says, To Seth also a son was born, he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. And so there's, you know, there's a community of people, descendants of Seth in this in this context, calling themselves, calling on the name of the Lord. When we get to Israel and the story of Israel, the account of Israel in Exodus, they're described as God's firstborn. They're described as, as God's son in Exodus chapter 4. And perhaps more directly relevant to a passage we'll look at shortly in Deuteronomy, in chapter 14, beginning of that chapter, So God, in addressing the people through Moses, says, you are the sons of the Lord your God. So addressing Mm. the nation that that has been been formed and created, you are the sons of the Lord your God. And when we come into the New Testament, we get a very consistent theme of, you know, baptized believers, Christians are referred to as as sons of God. So let's just take one example of that in Galatians chapter 3, and I think it's verse, about verse 25, 26. Yeah, so now that faith has come, the Apostle Paul says, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So the concept of by baptism becoming related to Christ and becoming related to all those Old Testament things through Abraham and Israel you know, an extension of the seed, as it were, from the Old Testament. So that concept of the faithful people of God, bearers of God's name, being called the sons of God, is is right through Old and New Testament. And, and I think that is a sensible, scriptural, consistent way of, of, of looking at Genesis chapter 6. Okay, so let's do that then, apply that to that passage. What What is the message of, of Genesis 6 then? <laughs> well, there's a challenging question, but just to offer... A perspective on that. So sons of God, faithful human beings that recognized God and his authority intermarrying with the daughters of men. So presumably people that didn't recognize mm-hmm. Yahweh or, or God. And there's an intermingling of the faithful community and the un- unfaithful. And so th- there's a breaking down of the barriers, the boundaries, if you like, between those those communities, which results in you know, disorder, wickedness, violence, corruption in in the earth. And that's actually quite consistent with what's already happened in Genesis. So so as part of the creation, a lot of that was about separating light mm. from darkness, the land, the land from the sea, the, the waters above from the waters below. God's ordering is a, a series of separations. And then Adam and Eve 
in in their garden situation sin and one of the things they want to do is is essentially break down the order the boundary between humans and god they want to be as god and that's the, part yeah. of the appeal of eating the fruit and then along comes this pre-flood situation and there's another breaking down of of the separation and that leads to wickedness and corruption it, pervading society on earth and then tower of babel is the same you have people building a tower to reach to heaven to you know break through the ceiling mm. if you like and mm. occupy a position in heaven as it were so all of those things are about the breaking down of the order the separation order that god had started within creation god's order becomes corrupted and and so there's a response to that so there's an explanation. There's yeah. much more that could be said. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much more about this passage, like what are the Nephilim that come mm. up in a couple of verses later, and what, what does all that mean? And my overriding sense is this this passage has been subject to so many different views and interpretations, and it would seem not sensible mm. to base a whole worldview on, on this passage, particularly when it runs counter to other fairly substantial things and, and interpretations in the rest of the Bible. But I, I do wonder as well that there might be something similar happening here in that there are quite possibly other stories of, of men of renown, of of the Titans, all sorts of mythological ideas. And these are the people that constructed Babylon and aren't, aren't we great? And isn't our city great? Whereas actually, again, Genesis is, is describing human history in these ways to show that it, it, it's really the problem is humans. You know, we shouldn't be going off and trying mm. to find an unseen realm and trying to attribute blame to other other things. The rebellion and mm. the violence and the corruption is humanity, which is which is basically that you know, verse five: God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So that's the summary, isn't it? It's human heart. So, yeah. so even if we can't yeah. be sure about the absolute little detail of it all. I think we can see the overriding story is is one of human rebellion, yeah. isn't it? I think you're right, Dan. And that, as a summary, seems to have support running through different parts of Scripture. So humans, as it were, reaching to grasp something that is not theirs by right to be as God. Adam and Eve convincing themselves that if they ate the fruit, their eyes would be opened and they would be like God. And those kings who set themselves up as godlike figures to be worshipped by the people they were they oppressed they were reaching for the same kind of thing. And so when the prophets rail against that, it shouldn't surprise us that they use some of this kind of language that does come from ancient cultural context as a way of ridiculing those claims and showing that they're just humans. They will fall and die like any other human until the real problem of human rebellion is solved. Now, I'm looking at the clock now and taking a reality check here that we're not going to get through all that we want to cover in one episode. Uh, there's a surprise. But rather than rush it, I think we'll split this into two episodes. We'll pause here and finish off in a second episode. But what we've done so far is just outline the worldview and salvation plan epitomized in Michael Heiser's book, The Unseen Realm. We've started to test it against the two criteria – is it in line with monotheism? And is it consistent with comments by Jesus and the apostles? We've looked at the first couple of claims. Firstly, that there was a heavenly council in Eden from which an angel fell and seen that there is really thin support for that in the Bible text itself. The sections in the prophets Ezekiel and Isaiah that are, are used to support this claim, they use language that references Eden, but is entirely consistent with their oracles against the human kings of Tyre and Babylon. And then when we came to Genesis 6, we saw that if we accept Jesus' comment about angels, it becomes really hard to justify a view that the sons of God were fallen angels. And, and we found actually a consistent use of sons of God of communities of faithful humans. And that fits in Genesis 6 with the rest of what those early Genesis chapters are about. So next time, we'll look at the verses in Deuteronomy 32 and also think about a couple of passages in Job and in Psalm 82 that are used to support this divine counsel worldview. So I hope you can join us next time. But until then, goodbye and God bless. Mm -hmm.